This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and for information on how to volunteer to join Project LibriVox, please see www.librivox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster. www.alexfoster.me.uk. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 41 The Great Explosion and the Rush Down Below. The next day, Thursday, August 27th, is a well-remembered date in our subterranean journey. It never returns to my memory without sending through me a shudder of horror and a palpitation of the heart. From that hour we had no further occasion for the exercise of reason, or judgment, or skill, or contrivance. We were henceforth to be hurled along the playthings of the fierce elements of the deep. At six we were afoot. The moment drew near to clear away by blasting through the opposing mass of granite. I begged for the honour of lighting the fuse. This duty done, I was to join my companions on the raft, which had not yet been unloaded. We should then push off as far as we could and avoid the dangers arising from the explosion, the effects of which were not likely to be confined to the rock itself. The fuse was calculated to burn ten minutes before setting fire to the mine. I therefore had sufficient time to get away to the raft. I prepared to fulfil my task with some anxiety. After a hasty meal, my uncle and the hunter embarked whilst I remained on shore. I was supplied with a lighted lantern to set fire to the fuse. Now go, said my uncle, and return immediately to us. Don't be uneasy, I replied. I will not play by the way. I immediately proceeded to the mouth of the tunnel. I opened my lantern. I laid hold of the end of the match. The professor stood, chronometer in hand. Ready? he cried. Aye. Fire! I instantly plunged the end of the fuse into the lantern. It spluttered and flamed, and I ran at the top of my speed to the raft. Come on board quickly and let us push off. Hands, with a vigorous thrust, sent us from the shore. The raft shot twenty fathoms out to sea. It was a moment of intense excitement. The professor was watching the hand of the chronometer. Five minutes more, he said. Four. Three. My pulse beat half seconds. Two. One. Down, granite rocks, down with you. What took place at that moment? I believe I did not hear the dull roar of the explosion. But the rocks suddenly assumed a new arrangement. They rent asunder like a curtain. I saw a bottomless pit open on the shore. The sea lashed into sudden fury, rose up in an enormous billow, on the ridge of which the unhappy raft was uplifted bodily in the air with all its crew and cargo. We all three fell down flat. In less than a second we were in deep, unfathomable darkness. Then I felt as if not only myself but the raft also had no support beneath. I thought it was sinking, but it was not so. I wanted to speak to my uncle, but the roaring of the waves prevented him from hearing even the sound of my voice. In spite of darkness, noise, astonishment and terror, I then understood what had taken place. On the other side of the blown-up rock was an abyss. The explosion had caused a kind of earthquake in this fissured and abysmal region. A great gulf had opened, and the sea, now changed into a torrent, was hurrying us along into it. I gave myself up for lost. An hour passed away, two hours perhaps I cannot tell. We clutched each other fast to save ourselves from being thrown off the raft. We felt violent shocks whenever we were borne heavily against the craggy projections. Yet these shocks were not very frequent, from which I concluded that the gully was widening. It was no doubt the same road that Sacknusim had taken, but instead of walking peaceably down it, as he had done, we were carrying a whole sea along with us. These ideas, it will be understood, presented themselves to my mind in a vague and undetermined form. I had difficulty in associating my ideas together during this headlong race, which seemed like a vertical descent. To judge by the air which was whistling past me and made a whizzing in my ears, we were moving faster than the fastest express trains. To light a torch under these conditions would have been impossible, and our last electric apparatus had been shattered by the force of the explosion. I was therefore much surprised to see a clear light shining near me. It lighted up the calm and unmoved countenance of Hans. The skilful huntsman had succeeded in lighting the lantern, and although it flickered so much as to threaten to go out, 
It threw a fitful light across the awful darkness. I was right in my supposition. It was a wide gallery. The dim light could not show us both its walls at once. The fall of the waters which were carrying us away exceeded that of the swiftest rapids in American rivers. Its surface seemed composed of a sheaf of arrows hurled with inconceivable force. I cannot convey my impressions by a better comparison. The raft, occasionally seized by an eddy, spun round as it still flew along. When it approached the walls of the gallery, I threw on them the light of the lantern, and I could judge somewhat of the velocity of our speed by noticing how the jagged projections of the rocks spun into endless ribbons and bands, so that we seemed confined within a network of shifting lines. I suppose we were running at a rate of thirty leagues an hour. My uncle and I gazed on each other with haggard eyes, clinging to the stump of the mast, which had snapped asunder at the first shock of our great catastrophe. We kept our backs to the wind, not to be stifled by the rapidity of movement which no human power could check. Hours passed away, no change in our situation, but a discovery came to complicate matters and make them worse. In seeking to put our cargo into somewhat better order, I found that the greater part of the articles embarked had disappeared at the moment of the explosion, when the sea broke in upon us with such violence. I wanted to know exactly what we had saved, and with the lantern in my hand I began my examination. Of our instruments, none were saved but the compass and the chronometer. Our stock of ropes and ladders was reduced to a bit of cord rolled around the stump of the mast. Not a spade, not a pickaxe, not a hammer was left us, and, irreparable disaster, we had only one day's provisions left. I searched every nook and corner, every crack and cranny in the raft. There was nothing. Our provisions were reduced to one bit of salt meat and a few biscuits. I stared at our failing supplies stupidly. I refused to take in the gravity of our loss. And yet what was the use of troubling myself? If we had had provisions enough for months, how could we get out of the abyss into which we were being hurled by an irresistible torrent? Why should we fear the horrors of famine when death was swooping down upon us in a multitude of other forms? Would there be time left to die of starvation? Yet by an inexplicable play of the imagination, I forgot my present dangers to contemplate the threatening future. Was there any chance of escaping from the fury of this impetuous torrent, and of returning to the surface of the globe? I could not form the slightest conjecture how or when, but one chance in a thousand or ten thousand is still a chance, whilst death from starvation would leave us not the smallest hope in the world. The thought came into my mind to declare the whole truth to my uncle, to show him the dreadful straits to which we were reduced, and to calculate how long we might yet expect to live. But I had the courage to preserve silence. I wished to leave him cool and self-possessed. At that moment, the light from our lantern began to sink by little and little, and then went out entirely. The wick had burnt itself out. Black night reigned again, and there was no hope left of being able to dissipate the palpable darkness. We had yet one torch left, but we could not have kept it alight. Then, like a child, I closed my eyes firmly not to see the darkness. After a considerable lapse of time, our speed redoubled. I could perceive it by the sharpness of the currents that blew past my face. The descent became steeper. I believe we were no longer sliding, but falling down. I had an impression that we were dropping vertically. My uncle's hand and the vigorous arm of hands held me fast. Suddenly, after a space of time that I could not measure, I felt a shock. The raft had not struck against any hard resistance, but had suddenly been checked in its fall. A water spout, an immense liquid column, was beating upon the surface of the waters. I was suffocating, I was drowning. But this sudden flood was not of long duration. In a few seconds I found myself in the air again, which I inhaled with all the force of my lungs. My uncle and hands were still holding me fast by the arms, and the raft was still carrying us. End of chapter 41 Recorded in Nottingham, England by Alex Foster on the 28th of January 2006
www.alexfoster.me.uk.